We'll be enchanted by the sights and sounds of this grand American estate. The show starts right after this. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about garden design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now, we have a beautiful place today to show you that represents this principle in quite a colossal and classic way. You see, this is the DuPont Estate, Winter Tour. It's in the Brandywine Valley in Delaware. Now, it's a big place, and even though it's some almost a thousand acres, there are lots of intimate garden spaces. And from these places, we're going to actually extract some great ideas that we can use in our gardens at home. A little later in the show, I'll take you on a tour through the Enchanted Woods. It's certainly a favorite spot for children and families to spend an afternoon exploring nature. I'll speak to my friend the Countess of Arran about the English influences she sees on this American house and garden. We'll also look at paths, and trust me, there's some interesting ones out here. Right now, let's find out more about the driving force behind this estate, Henry F. DuPont. Art and nature come together here at Winnetour in a big way, and that seems to be the founder's goal. Tom Savage, the director of Museum Affairs, tells us about Henry Francis DuPont, the creator of this magical place. You know, Winnetour is so beautiful, and it's amazing to me how nature really led Mr. DuPont through his entire life. You're absolutely right, Alan, particularly here at Winnetour. This was his ancestral estate. He was born here in 1880. He died here in 1969. Nature was really a first love. He discovered horticulture long before he discovered American. Well, he was actually trained in horticulture, Absolutely. wasn't he? He went to Groton, went to Harvard, not a brilliant student, but somehow had this incredible eye. And once he discovered horticulture, that just sent him on a path. Well, look at the life work he created that we're all enjoying today. Absolutely. He ended up creating probably America's most important woodland garden, and of course America's most important collection of fine and American decorative art. Blurring the lines between inside and outside is apparent here at Winnetour, and so is creating a unique harmony between cultivated landscapes and natural settings. Chris, I have to say, Winnetour is such a magical place. Thank you, Alan. You know, part of it is uh, the Brandywine Valley here near Wilmington. It's such a beautiful natural environment. It is. I mean, it, it, it's the perfect place to develop a, an outstanding woodland garden, and that's exactly what, what Mr. DuPont did. Yeah, exactly. Now, this particular space we're in, what do you call this? What was this laid out for? This is called the Sundial Garden, and the center part of it is this armillary sphere and base. And as the formal feature in the center of it, it sort of anchors the garden. I see. So the formality is here in the core of the garden, but as I look out on each side, the formality breaks down. It becomes much looser and, and casual. Yes, it's very lush and sort of romantic. Well, I think that one of the most enchanting parts of this garden is the woodland garden. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and what he was able to do in shade, because I know so many gardeners struggle with, with low light and shady areas. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the uh, March Bank, which is, is uh, what m many people think of as our woodland garden, is, uh, depending on how you divide it, six to eight acres of woodland garden that starts flowering in March and proceeds and continues to flower through May and actually still looks good even now. And that's quite an accomplishment in the shade. And, and, and again, here's another example of the sequence of bloom that was so important to him. Exactly. There's a, a real choreography starting with the early bulbs and leading to spring ephemerals that, um, that really leaves you without any gaps until, uh, I guess, the, the middle to late uh, May period. Now this idea of collecting, I mean, horticulturists are very much into, you know, I want this plant and that plant and creating collections. It's interesting to me that there's an obvious connection between the garden and the house. 
and the supreme collector he was of Americana. Absolutely. Some would even say hoarder in this case. <laughs> he bought on such a vast scale. And I, I think it's a natural extension that once he discovered Americana, he visited the Webb family at Shelburne in Vermont and noticed a pine dresser with Staffordshire plates on it. And the color combination struck him. So many of his generation and most within his family would have been more at home with French furniture with gilt ormolu mounts. This was, he was a yes. gilt child of the Gilded Age. Right. And he really is part of the movement against those excesses. Well, isn't that interesting how all of his childhood influences were European, but he really did embrace American furniture making, American crafts. Absolutely. He's a real pioneer in this field. And I think as time goes on, he's only become more important in the history of American design. What he does here is emulated not only by private collectors, but also by other museums in America. Now his collection just didn't end with a beautiful array of woodland flowers and trees and cattle and all the things that were a part of his farm and furniture. I mean, it went into textiles, porcelain, uh, uh, flatware. It's almost, it's comprehensive and visitors are both delighted and overwhelmed. One wasn't good enough. He had thousands of objects. <laughs> um, you know, the collection now numbers over 80,000 objects and by the time of his death, he had probably accumulated about 60,000 of those. So he was a collector on a vast, vast scale. Now this is a man who was engaged every day in the pursuit of just the right color combination from the garden and the house and from the house back out into the garden. Absolutely, he delighted in that. Very often the plants just outside the windows of rooms would relate specifically to antique textiles he had bought, um, to motifs on ceramics. Um, he really, Winotor can't be understood. The inside without the outside and the outside without the inside do not make as much sense. They really are an ensemble. And here we are in, in late in the season, mm -hmm. and the garden is largely green, but you're beginning to see some of those early autumn tones coming through in foliage, and there's a great deal of fruit set. Absolutely. Many of the parts of the garden were designed around the fruits that you see in the garden. So for example, Oak Hill near us right now is, is a garden that has lots of fruit and autumn interest. There's a big bank of autumn crocus, colchicum, that's in full flower right now. Probably thousands of colchicum flowers there. They are so gorgeous. I love how translucent the petals are. Absolutely. I, uh, that color with pink, and there's, there's a hint of blue in there that yeah, gives it a sort yeah. of shimmer that's very pretty. Yeah, they're, 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 they look so ephemeral. Yeah, exactly. And they look so delicate. Those are all so beautiful, but I want to get back to fruit for just a moment because I think as gardeners, we're, we're all seduced by flowers mm -hmm. and, and, and there's so much more that can go on in a garden. And I mean, certainly here in late summer and early autumn, the fruit set with, with the magnolias and, and gosh, the crab apples are fabulous. Oh, absolutely. Well, in this garden, we have this great bank of sergeant crabs and they have beautiful white flowers, but uh, they have these wonderful little cherry red fruit in the autumn. And right now they sparkle almost as much as they do in the spring. You know, Chris, I think for years people avoided crab apples because they, you know, they did have their problems, fire blight and other issues and, and the fruit can be messy, but they've done so much work with them now where they're, they're I think, um, I think they're much more mannered and better for gardens. Oh, absolutely. I know that they have varieties with persistent fruit and they have uh, resistant varieties, so you don't have to worry as much about disease. So Tom, in Winter's heyday, how large was the estate and how many people did Mr. DuPont employ? At its height, there were 2,600 acres. We now have 1,000, all under conservation easement, which is wonderful. There were 250 estate workers here, really? 89 gardeners, <laughs> of course, the indoor <laughs> staff. But Winotour would have been known to most people throughout the first half of the 20th century as a dairy farm. He had the most famous herd of Holstein Frisians. So he this was, was a working place. Very interested in agriculture. Absolutely. Really, his interests were almost equally divided in gardening, horticulture, farming, a gentleman farmer, and then the collecting he did for the house. How large is the house itself? House, as it is, as finished by Mr. DuPont, 175 rooms. <laughs> that is just staggering. And each room was chocked full of treasure. Chocked full, 
thematic based on color or where the objects come from. Each room told a story. Now, not each room was lived in. Some of them were considered, even when the family lived here, as museum rooms. You know, I, I find when I walk through the rooms, I'm so proud as an American to see what beautiful things Americans were creating at the end of the 17th century and throughout the 18th century. That would have made Mr. DuPont extremely happy to hear you say that. Yes, I mean, he was part of that pioneer group that made America realize that we didn't have to run to Europe for holidays, that what was here was of such great importance. You're absolutely right. He was, well, attracted to craftsmanship. And what he built eventually was this important museum, which is a teaching institution. We have graduate programs, the finest conservation program, a very excellent program that trains museum curators. So his legacy would go on. Yes, his spirit is very much alive here. Yes. Now, some of the other things that are going on in the garden, uh, I noticed the fruit set on some of the viburnums. There was one viburnum in particular that had um, almost um, this golden yellow fruit set. Which viburnum okay. is that? That's a, a dilatate variety of uh, the linden viburnum. Yes. Uh, called Michael Dodge. Well, I think it's a knockout. Yeah, it's beautiful. And you know, he combined it with calicarpa, the beauty berry. Yes, a, a calicarpa americana, our, our own beauty berry. Yeah, exactly. And that purple and yellow combination, something he enjoyed in the springtime with winter hazel and uh, azaleas. I think to me, what's the most fascinating about this place and Mr. DuPont is his love of of mixing colors and textures, not only within the house, mm -hmm. but in the garden and then combining them. You know, we've uh, come to the conclusion that his collecting sort of informed the garden and vice versa. So the colors he was using, you know, in the rooms were transferred out onto the grounds and, and back again. He really did blur the lines between inside and out. Absolutely. As I look around this estate, I see influences of the great European gardens I studied as a student in England. It's always interesting to walk through gardens and see the influences and where they come from. You can see, well, that's English and inspired by a certain period of English garden history, or that's decidedly Italian and can be associated with the Renaissance. During my visit to Winnetour, I had a chance to spend some time with quite an enthusiast of English gardens, Lady Erin. Her ancestral home, Castle Hill, is an important early 18th century landscape that actually influenced Mr. DuPont back in the early 20th century. Well, who would have thought we would have ended up together in a garden here in America? Well, it's a real treat to be here at Winter Tour. Well, I think that, I, I don't think it's ever rained quite this much when I've been in England in your garden. Well, I think we've always been lucky, but actually, let's face it, for us gardeners, we're thrilled to see the rain. It's very good, isn't it? Well, you know, the great thing about this garden is that I think it has so many dimensions, and certainly one of the most important is the woodland garden. Well, that's something I feel great empathy with because this is exactly what we have at Castle Hill. Now, there's some real connections between Winnetour and Castle Hill. I mean, Mr. DuPont actually came to Castle Hill. Well, he Hill. did indeed, and we've got records, or you have at Winterthur here, of when he, did, when he visited in 1911. Well, he was very taken with this idea of a woodland garden. Yes. Right from the beginning. Well, he must have been very innovative in his thinking. And wonderful as it is to have the formal gardens around the house, when you're going off on your walks, you need other interests. Now, you walk through the woods here at Winnetour, and you can see the work of Mr. DuPont in the mid-20th century, yes. uh, early to mid-20th century, yes. where they were carving out the vistas through this gorgeous woodland. Yes, yes. I, I think that that's wonderful to be able to retain these vistas, but somehow one has to encourage the next generation to do so because trees grow up. <laughs> right. and, one's, and one's inclined to think, well, I can't cut trees down. Well, I have to say that I don't subscribe to that view. If vistas get ruined, trees must go. Right, you lose the effect. You do, absolutely. Well, here at the end of summer and the onset of fall, you, if you look closely, you can see really interesting fruits on all sorts of plants. Yes, I've noticed that. The magnolias have the most wonderful red fruits, don't they? They really um, are outstanding. So what sort of exotics have you got here? Well, you know, what's in flower now is the heptacodium. Oh, they're so pretty, aren't they? I mean, they're really a late summer treat. 
They're gorgeous, along with so many of the hydrangeas. I know, and they are looking marvellous at the moment. Also, they'll be frightfully pleased to have had this rain, won't they? They will, and the colour of the leaf is coming out yes, this time of year. it really is. You can't forget about foliage. Well, it's been so wonderful seeing you here on this side of the pond. Well, it's been the greatest treat for me to be here. I've loved every minute of my visit. I can't wait for my next trip to Castle Hill. As you stroll along the grounds of English estates, you'll often encounter a range of path material. This material is often drawn from local sources, such as crushed seashells from along the coast. Granite or other locally quarried stone is often an option. Another path material that comes to mind is brick. It sure gets a lot of foot traffic on both sides of the Atlantic. One of the most important features in any garden, regardless of its size, is its paths. They should be something more than just a way to get from one place to another. It's an opportunity to use a lot of creativity, both in how the path is laid out and the materials used. Let's look at some of the possibilities. Bricks seem like a logical choice, but it's all in how you put them down. They can be simply placed on the ground where mosses and other plants can grow between them or laid in mortar. And because of their uniform shape, they're ideal for creating patterns and bordering other materials. Stone is also a natural for paths, from the tiniest pebbles to fist-sized cobbles like these. Or they can be flat stones with irregular shapes or large pieces of cut stone for those with money to spare. Paths can tell on us like shortcuts across our lawn where the grass begins to wear, looking like a cow path. Flagstones like these can be the perfect answer for such wear and tear. When you put them down, you just want to make sure they're spaced where you have a comfortable stride and that they're settled in low enough and secure enough that they don't wobble when you walk on them or hit them with the lawnmower blade when you mow the lawn. There are less expensive alternatives for paths like loose gravel or mulch or shredded bark or even cross sections of logs. And if you really want to get elaborate, you can cover your path with an arbor so you can enjoy your garden in the shade. Now we've just seen a wide range of path materials and the importance paths play in the design of a garden. But take a look at this path. This is in the Enchanted Garden at Winnetour. Now this path has multiple materials in it. And if you look closely, you can see that there's actually a snake motif woven into the path. As you can see, this serpentine path swirls its way around the perimeter of the garden. and makes a great strolling path. Along the way, you'll discover toadstools that make up the forbidden fairy ring. This circle of mushrooms is said to have been left there by the fairies after they spent a night of dancing in the forest. If you step inside the circle, you might be surrounded by a mist that will carry you directly into fairyland. At least, that's the legend of the enchanted woods. Over at the water's edge, you'll find Harvey, a huge frog. The sound of the water from Harvey's side of the woods is echoed on the other side by a system of biofilters made up of old animal troughs. Now, isn't that clever? You'll notice throughout the Enchanted Woods that the creatures here have taken architectural fragments and used them in lots of clever ways. Now, not all of the art here is made up of these castaway pieces of buildings. Just check out these two turtles over there sunning themselves on a log near a quiet stream. You see, there's a surprise at every turn. And take a look at this colossal bird nest. Can you imagine the bird that built this? What a fun place for kids to come up and get a view of the landscape beyond, saying hello to their friends, parents, and grandparents. Now, what's great about it is you can come up here and you can really hear the sounds of the forest and the wind blowing through the trees. Well, I'm ready to get out of here because I think the owner may be on its way back. Come on, let me show you some other areas. Now, if you get off the main path and you follow some of these little side trails, you come across charming features like this. This is Frog Hollow Bridge. Over the bridge and around the corner, you come to one of these enchanting, if not whimsical, seats. Here you can sit down and have plenty of support across your back with these twigs. Now, come over here and take a look at this. This is Tulip Tree House. It's made out of a solid trunk of tulip poplar. You've got an entryway here got a thatched roof across the top. I really like the way the thing's built. 
But I have to say, even though it's in a good neighborhood, I'm not so sure about the floor plan. Let's take a look at another house. Okay, now this is more like it. This is the fairy cottage, and as you can see, children love it. Now, this is interesting because it's made of all sorts of materials, bits and pieces that the fairies gathered. And fairies are notorious, you may know, for not finishing their work. So you can see that there are bits and pieces of the house missing, including the roof. They must be out here playing in the woods somewhere. Elements like this bring the child out in all of us. What a delight to have in any garden. In fact, let me show you a few of the details that make this tiny cottage space so very charming. The fairies have gathered up bits of marble, stones, interesting pottery, and other odds and ends that give their home lots of character. This fireplace is a wonderful example, don't you think? You see, fairies really don't know how to build, but they're very enthusiastic about it nonetheless. You can see the walls aren't straight, the windows aren't plumb. It probably wouldn't hold up to any kind of housing code. Just outside the cottage is a flagstone patio that surrounds a wishing well. I wonder how many people have stopped here to wish for a fairy cottage in their own backyard. You know, sometimes things aren't exactly what they appear. This is just a wooded garden, but to a child, well, it's shrouded in mystery and fantasy with a touch of whimsy. I had an opportunity recently in my garden to transform something ordinary with a bit of magic. Okay, well, maybe more imagination and a lot of carpentry. Let's take a look. This barn looks like new construction, and in a way, I suppose it is. But actually what we've done is we've taken an ugly old metal building and we've transformed it. We've given it a bit of a facelift so it fits more comfortably into the landscape we're creating out here. Now, this is what it used to look like. Now, I know we've all seen these buildings as we drive across the countryside, but just because a building is utilitarian doesn't mean that it has to stick out like a sore thumb in the landscape. Now, by raising the roof line up, We've given the structure a more classic barn-like appearance. The wood siding also helps. You see, it softens the edges and helps it blend into its environment. A metal roof to match the other outbuildings will be next. And the guys have already started to stain the structure with that deep, rich, black alder colored stain. Of course, this is no new idea. It's been going on for a long time. This notion of taking a building of function or utility and transforming it into something more attractive, perhaps even more charming. It started really in this country through English influences. The work of John Claudius Loudon in England influenced Andrew Jackson Downing here. And you began to see on farms across the country a different view, a different way of sort of seeing them, seeing them more as ornamented farms. You know what I mean, those that aren't strictly set up for profit. Now there's a big difference in these. You see these ornamented farms, well, there was some attention paid to how the buildings were laid out, the plantings around them, and the buildings themselves. Here, we're actually using materials and colors to create a certain hierarchy in the landscape. The functional buildings, the barns and outbuildings and so forth, are one color, as opposed to the non-functional buildings, such as the house, will be a different color. The barns will be brown, green trim around the windows, light fixtures will be green with the red roof, whereas the entry pavilions and the house itself will be painted butter yellow with white trim and all the fencing around it will be white. So you see, you've got a definite hierarchy or order of building. I hope you've enjoyed today's show as much as I have. This is such a beautiful place, and I hope that you've come away with some ideas that you can use in your own garden. Obviously, you don't have to have a garden the size of this estate. It's about taking home the spirit of the place. You might do something as simple as add a new plant to your garden, or cutting flowers and bringing them inside to match your interior decor. Just think about it. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. Beauty, color, style, and function, all elements we'll cover in the Garden Home. In this show, we'll visit an innovative winery on California's central coast where roses are cause for celebration. 
and I'll tell you where we are on installing the green components of the basement of my garden home. Plus some hands-on gardening tips that'll help bring taste and color into those dullest days of winter.